as a quantitative researcher, numbers are a key part of my life. They measure things that are important to us, like age or time. But for today, I'd like to reflect on two particular things, two events in my life that have happened more recently that have caused me to think more about what it means to count. Uh, and those two are my months-long stint with the U.S. Census Bureau and my piquant dating life. <laughs> we'll start with my dating life since there's not much there. <laughs> I am a college professor living in the Central Valley of California, and I am single. I find... <laughs> I find that once my dates get over the initially overwhelming sense that I'm grading every single word they say, then they often come to this place where they say, so tell me, how did you get involved in political science as a profession? And at this moment, I typically launch into my date-appropriate length, mini-missive, about growing up the daughter of a single parent living in poverty. Uh, I remember distinctly feeling powerless, feeling like I wasn't really a part of things. I did get my first job at 14 and regularly made financial contributions to my household. There were several times that I chipped in for rent so that we wouldn't get evicted. Again, that sense of powerlessness. But as I made my way through high school, I began to learn about democracy, this notion of government for and by the people, and about America and its lack of a feudal past, basically meaning that no matter where you start out, every single person has a chance at success, has a shot at upward mobility. I began to equate getting involved in government with my way out of poverty. I began to equate becoming involved in government as my way to become empowered. And I had hoped one day to run for office and become a politician. And as I reflect on that now, I begin to realize probably why I don't get many second or third dates. <laughs> well, about two years ago, my views sharpened dramatically on what it means to count when I had the benefit of serving as a census enumerator. And for those of you watching who aren't terribly familiar with the US Census, our Constitution ensures that every 10 years, we set out to count every single person living in America and figuring out where they live. As you can imagine, it is a huge, time-intensive, and very costly procedure. Well. Part of my job entailed the counting of homeless people. I and my census colleagues on one crisp evening in 2010 set out to count every homeless person in our identified area, and we were going to do so between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. We had leads on where the homeless people would be living, um, at the intersection of A Street and B Avenue in ABC Park. And as you can imagine, the first challenge then was locating them. Where were they? The second challenge, though, and perhaps more difficult challenge, was getting to be able to establish a minimal level of trust with people who had learned through experience not to trust. And to do so at least long enough to determine their gender and to get a good count. As you can imagine, setting up even that small level of trust is not an easy task with displaced individuals who may be in an altered state due to drug or alcohol abuse. They may be suffering with intractable mental illness, or frankly, they could simply be a little nervous about strangers approaching them in the middle of the night. So we were armed with food and drink, flashlights and caution, hoping at once to be safe and yet accomplish our goal of getting every single individual counted accurately. In that seven hour span, we were able to talk to 
two individuals who were willing to finally give a little information after we plied them with trail mix and apple juice. At the end, one of the women tearfully thanked us and begged for additional food. So why such a highly structured, time-intensive mission to only get two more individuals to add to this vast census database? Why did it matter? Why did they count? Well, from a political science perspective, the census is our only way of ensuring that we know how many people there are and where they live. And we do so for two basic reasons. The first is for political representation, okay? Typically in the form of Congress members. And the second piece has to do with financial resources, literally billions of dollars in federal aid that are given for things ranging from hospitals to schools to emergency preparedness, okay? So for example, post-2010 census, the state of New York had lost significant population, and so they lost two, house, two seats in the House. In contrast, Texas gained large population, and they had a net gain of four, okay? And again, part of the other piece is determining how best to channel those billions of dollars in financial aid. So, it is important to note here, though, that the census itself, the mode, is not an accident, okay? It is chosen with caution. And the census itself is the literal counting of every single person of interest, surveying every single person of interest in the population. But in contrast, Typical researchers like me who do empirical research, we rely on random sampling, which as you had seen in this animation, is taking a small percentage of that entire population, but then through the magic of statistics, being able to make inferences about the whole population and do so pretty accurately within a margin of error. It is robust, it is efficient, and it is highly cost-saving. However, interestingly enough, the census, the counting of every person, is the only way we've counted people since our history, since the country's inception. Oh, and by the way, the 2010 census, in which we counted 308 million people, well, that cost taxpayers $14.5 billion. So, again, the choice to retain the census way of counting people has something more to do with symbolism. What message are we sending to people? It becomes critical to let people know that you count. You count. We all count here. Okay? And what message would we be sending if suddenly one day we changed course and said we're moving to random sampling, so we're not counting all of you, but rather, we're gonna make some good statistical guesses based on this few people right here. Not good. Again, the message counts. You count. But do we all really count? In addition to the literal counting of people, political counting manifests in far more consequential ways. And we know in political science that through modes like voting, making campaign contributions, writing your member, we have a much higher probability of getting our message heard and probably getting some kind of a response to it. Okay? Therefore, making one's interest known, making one's interest visible, is one way to get represented. At a minimum, then, we have a voice. And of course, when making difficult, controversial choices, elected officials ultimately make decisions based on to whom they're accountable. And you should know that not all district members are equally watching and are equally holding them accountable. The squeaky wheel? Yeah, that's the one that gets the grease in the political realm not necessarily the most needful, not necessarily the most deserving. In fact, 
those who would probably be benefited most by public resources typically are those with the least voice, okay? And you know those friends of yours? You all have them. Those acquaintances that say, oh, forget it, I don't vote. Those politicians don't listen to me anyway. Yeah, well, unfortunately, they're engaged in a damning, self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, for some, this is not problematic in the least. Oh, no. We have those among us who think that if people are unwilling or unable to participate in their government, then you know what? Damn them. They don't deserve the representation. Okay? I declare that this flies in the face of true democracy, government for and by the people. Even representative democracy assumes one person, one vote. Okay. But what happens when 50% of eligible voters turn out during a presidential election year? We're in one now, folks. Okay. What happens when less than that turn out in non-presidential years? What happens when the Supreme Court of the United States rules that corporations have the same rights as people without having the same responsibilities. <laughs> what happens when money spending becomes a form of freedom of speech? I would argue that democracy exists in name only when two things happen. One, when we have elected officials who can reliably count on the same people refusing to hold them accountable time and time again. And two, when we have a government that is willing to grant non-human entities more rights than humans. There are very negative psychological implications too though, okay? When people don't feel like they're a part of society, okay? Something happens to a person when they are systematically made to feel powerless, marginalized, voiceless. The urge to fall out, fall into the background, drop out is overwhelming, and yet, History is filled with examples of people refusing to withdraw. You'll see some of them today. You've seen some. Nelson Mandela is another that comes to mind. A man who fought apartheid behind prison bars. Okay? But I want to let you know, each of you, that we don't need to be heroic in order to feel empowered. Okay? And in the interest of time, I offer you three, three points for empowerment, ranging from the pretty challenging to the super absolutely doable, okay? One, the challenging one. <laughs> Run for elected office, okay? President Teddy Roosevelt said, the one duty of every man is that he shall fulfill duty in public office. He was talking about being an elected official, okay? Run for your council. Run for your school board dog catcher. Get involved. Volunteer in a political office. Find out what it's like to face constituents who have unlimited demands in the face of very scarce resources, okay? Get involved. And fortunately for us, in the American context, we live in a system of federalism where thousands, literally thousands of governments abound, therefore giving us multiple opportunities for involvement at the local level, county level, etc. Okay? Keep government accountable by watching, okay? Watch what government does, but don't just watch, respond. In the technological era that we live in, it is easier than ever to obtain information, OK? 
okay? Keep tabs. John Wooden once said that the true test of a man's character was what he would do when people weren't watching him. Well, my take on that is, if you want a man to behave like he has character, watch him. (laughs) Typically, people like us wait until something goes wrong until we react. But why wait that long? Accountability counts. And finally, if all else fails, and politics completely burns your nose with its odorous scent, then please consider becoming involved in your community, okay? In our parlance, we talk about building political capital through the building of social capital. And what do I mean by this? I mean things ranging from joining a Kiwanis club, a knitting circle, volunteering at your animal shelter or your church group. Whatever it takes, Get involved. Sometimes the opportunities to grow are completely out of the realm of anticipation when we step outside of ourselves and become part of something bigger than us. At the end of the day, we will get the government that we deserve or at least the government that we allow. But if we want to count, we must first stand. Thank you.